If you are new to Darktable, it's possible that you could look at the collection of modules available in the Darkroom view and be absolutely swamped for choice. So, in this video, we're going to simplify things. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 71 of Understanding Darktable. This is going to be a little bit of a companion episode to episode 69, and I didn't plan on them being a pair of episodes that go together. In fact, it was really just meant to be one episode, but after the event, I thought to myself, hmm, probably could have addressed the use of various modules. So I thought that I would create a special video just to cover this idea. So for the purposes of this, as you saw in the opener, we're currently using Darktable 3.2.1. I'm just going to randomly uh, choose an image from the road trip that Kath and I did a couple of months ago. And I have reset the history stack. And if you are wondering why there are eight history items here for an image that has supposedly been reset, then you, my friend, need to go and watch episode 69 or watch it again, as the case may be. Uh, and I'll throw a link up in the top left-hand corner if you haven't already watched that episode, uh, because I do explain why the history stack has so many things in it, even in its default or reset state. Okay, so down the bottom of the darkroom view in the right-hand corner, we have a button called More Modules. And this contains the list of every module that exists in Darktable. And on the right hand side there is a hamburger and if we click on that you can see that there is a bunch of preset collections of modules who have been made visible and then saved as a preset. So if we go subset default modules we will see, I'm just going to close that, which modules are visible by default. And we've got five groups, the basic group, the tone group, the color group, the correction group, and the effects group. And if we look at them, we've got, I don't know, eight or nine modules in the basic group. We've got two in the tone group. We've got two in the color group. We've got four in the corrections group, and we've got none in the effects group. That's the default. I think I counted it. It came to about 16 modules turned on by default. I'm going to suggest that for a new user, just to get up and running, that we go to the hamburger and we choose subset no module and we open this list up and we scroll up to the top and I'm going to suggest just 10 modules that I think you want to turn on and just use those while you process your first, you know, 10 or 20 images, just so that you get the hang of the interface, the way the modules work, what they can do, what they can't do, all that sort of stuff. And then once you've got your head around it, you can then choose to enable other modules as you see fit. Now, when a module is made invisible, as in it's not showing up in any of these groups, its background is dark grey. To change that to making a module visible, we simply left click on it once. And depending on which of these five groups this module natively belongs to, that's where it will appear. So in this instance, the basic adjustments module belongs in the basic group. If we click on any one of these twice, so if I click on it again, you'll see that on the left hand side it gets a little star icon added to it. And what that means is this module is not only visible, but it's been added to the favorites group, which is the second group here. So you can favorite wh whichever modules you want. If you know that, hey, this handful of modules, I'm gonna use these all the time, you can make them a favorite and they will always appear in this favorite group. The very first group, the one with the power symbol, that is the 
group of modules which are currently active on the image that you are currently working on. So this group is going to change as you move from one image to the next through your catalog of images. Okay, so I'm going to start by just selecting that once. So it's visible in the basic group, but it's not visible in the favorites group. Okay, so that is the first module out of the 10 that I think a new user definitely should start with. It's called basic adjustments because that's exactly what it is. It gives you most of the tools that you need to dial in the basics of your image. Number two, color modules. You'll notice that when you look at the list, there is quite a range of modules devoted to color. And as I've mentioned in other videos in this channel, the developers of Darktable are suggesting that we should adopt an RGB oriented workflow because it's linear, where the lab color space is non-linear. And for that reason, the color module that is suggested for, you know, adopting an RGB workflow is color balance. Now, personally, I find the color balance module to be quite intimidating because there is a stack of controls in there. Now, if you're not scared by the number of controls, by all means, go for it. But I'm going to be a little bit of a rebel here and suggest that as a third module out of our 10, that we also adopt color correction. Because to me, that is a much easier module to use if you just want to shift the color balance one way or another. It's as simple as I want more reds in my image, so I left click and I drag towards red. Or I want it more yellow, so I left click and I drag up towards yellow, or whatever the case may be. It's crude, it's rough, it's ready, but it is a lot simpler to interface with if you are a new user and you are intimidated by the color balance module. So I'm sort of going against the grain of what the developers are trying to push us towards, but I'm going to suggest that if you are new to Darktable, maybe just go with the color correction module for any color adjustment stuff that you need to do. I'm actually not sure which color space the color correction module works in. I'm guessing it's probably lab, but anyway. Number four, the crop and rotate module. At some point, you are going to want to crop and or rotate your images. So to me, this is pretty obvious. You're going to want that switched on. Number five, denoise profiled. Now, again, you'll notice that there is a handful of denoise oriented modules. I'm going to suggest that you start with denoise profiled. It belongs in the corrections group. I shouldn't say belongs. It's not like you have a choice. It defaults to the corrections group because that's what it is. Denoise profiled, if you are new to Darktable, basically references a database in the background and it works by reading the EXIF metadata of the image you've chosen to work on. And from that EXIF metadata, it can calculate, assuming, of course, you've shot digitally. If you're working with a film scan, then all bets are off. But if you're working with an image that was captured on a digital camera, then the EXIF metadata will include information like the ISO, the camera brand, and and most likely the camera model. And from those three things, Denoise profiled can actually go and find a profile that matches your digital camera, the model as well as the make, and that particular ISO setting. So in this instance, we can see it has found a match for ISO 6400. And that is not just generic to all cameras. If we expand that, we can see that all of those profiles relate to the Sony a7 III because that's what I've shot this image on. And so by default, 
it has recognized that this was shot on an A7 III at 6400 ISO, and so it has chosen a denoise profile for that camera and that ISO. For a new user, I highly recommend that this is where you start if you want some denoising tools. Once you've got your head around it, then you can dive into the other stuff. Number six, the highlight reconstruction module. Now, hopefully you're not going to need this all of the time, but occasionally you're going to import an image and you're going to realize, oh, I've probably clipped some highlights there. This module will come to your rescue. And Darktable seems to be pretty clever about automatically applying highlight reconstruction if and when it detects that there are clipped modules. So you may find that this gets activated automatically, but if it doesn't, you can always switch it on for yourself. The method defaults to clip highlights, but I personally find that I prefer reconstruct in LCH. For me, just does a slightly nicer job, but your mileage may vary. Number seven, the retouch module. Now, this is quite a daunting module to look at. And for that purpose, I would definitely suggest that you go and check out the video that I did on the retouch module. And again, I'll try and remember to put a link up there for you. This is a great module. It does a fantastic job of you know cleaning up dirt or cloning out things that you don't want. Obviously, Darktable is not a multi-layer image editing program like Photoshop or GIMP. It's not meant to be like that. This is a, an app that is designed to work on a single image at a time. But the retouch module does some very clever stuff by breaking your image apart into wavelets, if you so choose to use it in that sense and it can do some very seamless retouching once you've got your head around how it works. That's probably the most complicated module out of the 10 that I'm going to suggest. Number eight, the RGB curve. Now, you shouldn't need this if you've used the basic adjustments. In between exposure and contrast, you should be able to get your image pretty much to where you want it. But in those instances where a tone curve can just help you to finesse, maybe you just need to lift the, the shadows a little bit, but you don't want to affect the highlights, a tone curve will just give you that level of control that you're not going to get from just exposure and contrast adjustments. So I would suggest the RGB curve is worth having active. Again, you're not going to need it on every image, but when you need it, it's good to have. Number nine, the sharpen module. Pretty much does what it says on the tin. And, you know, a little bit of sharpening goes a long way, uh, like any image editing, particularly with digital files, because of the demosaicing algorithm, you occasionally get a little bit of softening of your image. So a little bit of sharpening before export is a good move. And lucky last, number 10, the white balance module. Now, that module will be activated by default, even if it's not visible. Okay, if I was to go back and actually before, before I reset this, I'm going to save this as a group. So I'm going to go store new preset and I'm just going to call this episode 71 because that's all I need it for because as you will see there, I have my own collection saved, Bruce V1. But if we go back to no modules, and even if I was to compress the history stack, you will notice that the white balance module has already been activated. So even though the module is not visible in any of these five groups, and it's not visible in our favorites group, it is visible in the active group because it's part of the default selection of things that Darktable does in order to take a raw file and actually show something on screen. And again, I covered all of this in episode 69. So it's interesting to note that there are going to be modules in the active tab 
that you may not have visible in your groups. Things like orientation. I haven't suggested that you turn that on. Most of the time, you're not going to need the orientation module. But if you do, you'll always find it in the active group. But if you want to turn it on, by all means, go find it in the list and switch it on and either have it just in its group or add it as a favorite, whatever works for you. So those are the 10 modules that I would recommend for a new user just to activate and work with for your first half dozen, 20 images, whatever, until you get your head around it. Now, let's just have a quick look at any one of these modules. With these sliders, there's a bunch of ways to interact with them. You can left click and drag. You can see exposure will go to minus four stops or up to plus four stops. You can also right click and you get this interface that I've not seen in any other software and I call it wag the dog. Basically, if you move your mouse right down to the bottom of this graph, you'll notice that the changes in that exposure value are in one one hundredth of an EV. And then as you move your mouse towards the top of the graph, that control becomes more coarse. So there's that way to dial in any adjustment, because this works on pretty much every slider in Darktable. This is not just exclusive to the exposure module. So there's that way. Or you can right click and you will notice that if you don't move your mouse, you get this flashing cursor on the right hand side. And I can now dial in a number just by hitting a number. I might want 2.5 stops of exposure, press enter, and two and a half stops of exposure have been added. Now, as I said before, with regards to this exposure slider, you've got minus four to plus four EV. However, you can make that go further. And to do that, you would simply right click and enter a greater value like six, press enter. And now that exposure range goes to plus six EV. And you'll notice that the center point has now been shifted a little bit to the left to reflect that because the negative value is still minus four. I could right click on that and go minus six and that will push this back to the center and we now have a range from minus six stops to plus six stops. Now, that only relates to the image you are currently editing. Okay, so if you now jump to another image, the default values for that exposure slider will be minus four to plus four once again. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there. My intent was just to show you the very basics in terms of modules that I think a new user should have active in order to just get some work done without being overwhelmed by choice. As you can see from the more modules uh, down here in the bottom right hand corner, there is a lot of modules in Darktable and many of them can do similar things. Like I said, you know, with the color selection, yeah, there's about seven or eight modules that all relate to color. Which one you use will depend on what you need to do and, you know, the way your brain works. You know, in some cases, you just find that one person likes a particular color module and somebody else likes a different color module just because of the way they think. And that's fine. That is absolutely fine. But hopefully this has given you an introduction and you can take this idea, activate those 10 modules, and that should get you out of trouble for 99% of your image editing. And once you've got up and running, got your workflow happening, you can then dive in, investigate the other modules and work out for yourself which ones you want as part of your regular workflow. And like I said, any that you want to have access to quickly, just click on them twice in that more modules group so that you get the little star icon to the left hand side and that will add them to your favorites group so that they're always available on this favorites group here. Alrighty, that's gonna do it for this one. 
I was actually planning to have a completely different topic for this episode, but I'm working on some stuff in the background. I'm actually getting a loan of a piece of equipment. Uh, so that particular, it's actually a series of videos. It's not just one video. Uh, it's going to have to wait a, a week or two. Uh, it's something that a few people have been calling out for. And yeah, I won't say any more just yet. Just know that I'm working on something in the background. It's probably going to take me a few weeks to get it all happening. But yeah, looking forward to that. Alrighty, people. I will catch you in the next one.